You are in the ladies' room with Dr. Donica, the only public ladies' room you can enter any time without ever waiting online. I'm your host, Dr. Donica Moore. We'll be having real conversations with real women about really intimate issues. They may be embarrassing, sad, or funny, but they will always be interesting and informative. You know, like the best conversations you've had in ladies' rooms with your best friends or total strangers and a physician. Please join us. Hello, and welcome to an extra special episode of In the Ladies' Room with Dr. Jonica today. It is our 100th episode. I can't believe it. Um, We started this podcast in January 2018, and I want to thank all of our loyal listeners and welcome all the new ones who've gotten us to this point. We've had over 22,000 downloads and have listeners now in 32 countries. Now, my guest uh, today is a friend of the show who millions know as Dorothy the Organizer, the fearless yet endearing efficient problem solver on the hit show Hoarders on A&E. Now, you may have seen Dorothy Berenger on many other TV shows as well. She appears frequently on the Today Show, the Dr. Phil Show, The View, The Doctors, QVC, and PBS. But most importantly, she was one of our earliest guests in the ladies' room in episode six, when she talked about her newest of five books, Face Your Stuff or Stuff Your Face. And I need to read that one again. She's also heard, um, we also heard about how she was the caretaker for her sister with stage four uh, breast cancer. And this led her to creating the Cancer Concierge online video system and the Digital Life Cloud to help people organize their medical and other important records, which is extremely even more important now. Now, we're chatting today during the week that Dr. Anthony Fauci of the National Institutes of Health, Governor Andrew Cuomo of New York, and even President Trump anticipated would be one of the toughest weeks of the coronavirus outbreak. But I'm going to talk to Dorothy about the week that was probably the toughest for her, which was her personal experience of being a coronavirus patient, as well as the wife of a patient with COVID-19. And we're going to get her top tips for planning and preparing for the tough weeks ahead. We're also going to talk about how you can best put your time to very good use while staying home during this pandemic by decluttering and better organizing your home and your home office. And I know you're all thinking the same two things I am right now. First, is there anything this woman can't do? And second, more importantly, when can she come to my house? Dorothy, welcome to the ladies' room. Welcome to you. And here's why I want to say welcome while you were doing this opening. Um, this pay, It pays to be organized, Dr. <laughs> Donica. Okay, it does. Because I'll tell you what you said to me or to all of your listeners and viewers that it's your 100th episode. And here's what I have to say about <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> confetti. I love when a guest <laughs> brings their own confetti. <laughs> and Congratulations. Manages, and manages, thank you so much. This has really been a labor of love, as you know, and a lot of fun. And I've certainly learned a lot. Uh, sometimes, though, I don't learn enough the first time I have a guest and they have to come back and teach well, me more. So the first thing I want to ask you, just as a follow-up to our last conversation in 2018, uh, is how is Pat doing? Well, my sister did pass away. I'm and so, so I'm so glad you asked because, you know, as a caregiver and you put so, or I put so much effort, attention and love into her that, you know, now it's, it's been a while and I can look back with no regrets. That's awesome. And, and that's, we want to give them a good life while they're alive. And we also want to live healthily after they pass. And we can do that by giving them the attention and the care they need when they are living. So she's doing just fine Mm. where she is right now. Well, thankful. And thank you. And that's great advice now because unfortunately, so many more people are dying uh, from this coronavirus outbreak. In the past three days alone, I've done five condolence calls for friends who've lost parents and other loved ones. Uh, and you were one of the lucky ones. Actually, you were two of the lucky ones because I yes. understand both you and your husband had coronavirus. So tell us what happened. We did. You know, in early March, uh, late February, early March, we were one of the early cases. And um, my husband, Marty, is 65 and I'm 57. 
So uh, he was able to get tested. We both went for testing, but they didn't have any or barely any test kits at that time. Right. So what I did you get tested? What symptoms did you have first? Yeah, the, they came in this order, actually. So first it was we were sleepy, and then we both had a fever. Then came the body aches, the chills, the small cough, and loss of appetite, and then a tummy ache. So that's kind of the order it came in for us. I had my fever for five days and my husband, Marty, had his for 14 days. It was wow. super scary. Yeah. Wow. And uh, I oftentimes was kind of shaking him and say, stay with me here. Come on now. So, you know, we learned a lot very quickly and actually put out, you know, uh, a COVID-19 guide to get organized, uh, whether you have it or whether you don't, you know, so... You are great about putting together those guides. How can people get that? How can oh, I get that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You can just go to DorothyTheOrganizer.com and right at the top, it's free and it says COVID-19 uh, 10-day organizing guide. And it helps you with prevention and planning, getting your resources together, meal planning, you know, working from home, which everyone seems to be doing already pretty well, a family plan. Uh, self-care, finances, all that kind of stuff, just one day at a time to, to kind of review. And truth be told, did you do that before you were sick or after or during? During. <laughs> no, during. I knew it was during. <laughs> during. Yeah, I mean, there were some days I could not get out of bed, but once I was over my fever, and by the way, the key that we found was when you sweat it out, when you start sweating in the night, uh, for like two or three days in a row, that means it's leaving your system for us. Uh, so that's, that's when we both turned the corner. And of course, during that time, I called my doc doctor and asked for testing. She gave us permission for the testing. And by the way, if you are going to go do some drive-through testing in New York, obviously it was walk-up testing, mm -hmm. but many places out here in California is drive-through, but you want to take something to keep you busy because you want some water, you want to have a book, you want to have something. You're not talking to others and you're waiting a long time to get the test. So, um, and wear some loose clothing <laughs> so that when you're in your car, the doctors reach in and they actually, you know, do your vitals and they listen to your lungs. So you want to be able to get that stethoscope up under, underneath your shirt. So little things like that, that we learned uh, from both the symptoms and the testing. So did you and your husband both get sick simultaneously or was one of you sick first? He came, he came down with it first and then I got it immediately. So his was slower to take hold and slower to get rid of. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's when they say that's why people who are a little older, it's only eight years, but still it's a bit of a difference. Uh, so I got it while he had it. Got so it. I was in it and back out of it before he was over his. Well, and there is some data to show that men don't do as well as women uh, when they get this. Um, and all, all the jokes that I could make aside about that, um, you know, it's, it is very serious. Although women are much more likely uh, to be infected, women do tend to have a shorter and more successful course. And that does not mean that thousands of women have not also died of this. So, you know, I don't want to minimize uh, anybody's experience. And I also want to make very clear that when we talk about your experience and Marty's experience, we're talking about your experience and Marty's experience. We're not saying what should be or could be for anyone else or giving anybody any specific medical advice other than to talk to their doctor. And the good news is that by now, most doctors are having... Uh, video telemedicine visits available. Yes. Um, which is something I hope that carries over uh, after this, because there are a lot of medical appointments that we really don't need to go in person. Oh my gosh, the time savings for not just doctor's appointments, but all of my meetings with my team and with my clients. I'm doing virtual organizing now because I can't go into client homes. So all of my team members are working with clients on video, on FaceTime, Google Hangout, whatever it is, and we see their space and we help them with the next step and the next step, and they're getting it done really fast. That's awesome. It. Yeah. That's really great. I have to say, just in advance of talking to you, if you can see the, um, the furniture behind my shoulder, 
I was like, oh no, I'm talking to Dorothy Brenninger. I have to clean off all my piles of mail. Um, But you will not be happy to hear that the way I cleaned it off was I just put it all in a very lovely basket. And (laughs) I will deal with it afterwards, but I did also attack some of the piles on my desk. Well, congratulations. Thank you. So um, just back to you and Marty being sick and obviously, uh, you know, him being a little older, did either of you have any pre-existing medical conditions? Yeah, Marty gets pneumonia, I think, um, every year for the last three years. So he's got something. And I do have asthma. Mm-hmm. And I still have a little bit of wheezing left over. But, um, you know, we both have now been completely cleared and we're safe to move about the cabin. <laughs> oh, well, we're not flying, so never mind that. But y- you know what I mean? It's right. just... Yeah, we're, we're both okay, but yes, yes. That's great. But here's w- one other major tip. Um, Dr. Patrick Soon Chung, who owns the LA Times, I think, and part of the Lakers, lives out here in Los Angeles. He did a really great um, episode, I think, well, online, and I saw it on YouTube. And it's all about the science of soap. Mm-hmm. And I listened to that early on. And it seems that it's not just the the hand washing, but it's really the hand rubbing because the coronavirus actually is very fatty and greasy, I learned. Mm -hmm. And that that soap, like Dawn soap, how it cuts the grease. Well, it it really really cuts right through the outer shell of the virus. It does. And so, you know, it's not the washing, but the rubbing that made the difference. And once I learned that the soap actually kills that virus when that, in that 20 seconds, it kills it. I just thought it was being safe. But no, it actually is something that changed my life on how I wash my hands and how I think we got better faster. So it's not just, as you said, it's not just the washing, but also the physical rubbing. And that's to make sure that you're getting all of the virus, all over the entire exposure of your hands, including those inner crevices. But what I've also been talking to uh, people about is the drying. So many people, uh, you know, in terms of preparation and organizing, you'll like this. Uh, What occurred to me in the beginning, and I do have uh, four millennials staying with me during this time. Uh, So we first assigned people to different bathrooms so they could only use one bath. Each person could only use one bathroom and couples got to share bathrooms. But what I also realized is in our powder room, there's a, you know, we have the guest towels that are hanging and you shouldn't be sharing towels. So I took those out and just put baskets by the kitchen sink and in the powder room sink with, I got, uh, two dozen extra washcloths from amazon.com in 24 hours. There's a plug for Amazon. And I put just piles of washcloths uh, in these baskets by the sinks to use as single use uh, Mm -hmm. washcloths. And then just a bucket on the floor to throw the used ones in and they get laundered daily. So what are some of your other tips like that around the house that people should be thinking about in terms of- I've got two that come to mind right away. You were talking about linens and towels. I like that idea. We did the same thing. We did quarantine ourselves from each other, even though we both had it. We just didn't know if we could get it back or not. So we took all precautions and took all the towels out, including in the kitchen and only wet paper towel. Um, But we also changed the sheets every other day. Mm -hmm. And so it was essential because the virus lives on material. I I laundered, um, Kate Snow, you know, is an anchor for one of our uh, evening news, right? And I know she she said she did laundry night and day. Yeah, because I made Marty take off those pajamas, switch to another, pillowcases, laundry all the time. So that was one. And the other was, when in doubt, you know, when you're just thinking, oh, it won't matter. It's just a little piece of mail. I don't need to wash it off before I bring it in the house. When you have that thought of it doesn't matter, that's when it matters. Mm -hmm. That's when it matters. But I will give you a tip. You don't need to wash every piece of mail or every package. What I do is I just leave it in the garage for two days and then bring it in because I'm not a big, uh, I like to minimize cleaning. And I want to clarify to everybody about the washing the sheets tip. That's for people who are sick. 
For people yes. who are not sick, you do not need to do that. <laughs> uh, we have everybody on a once a week uh, schedule. I also assigned everybody different colors of towels. So we know whose towels are whose. And then I got the brilliant idea a couple of weeks into it of everybody doing their own laundry. But that was just to minimize my <laughs> workload. Um, I also went around the house and I saw like these sneaky things that we don't normally think about. And I think this is something you'd probably be fabulous with as an organizer, you know, on FaceTime, just seeing those sneaky things. So how many people who are listening have a toothbrush holder in their, in their bathroom uh, that has multiple people's toothbrushes in very close proximity. Uh, not only did I get rid of that, but I also realized with great chagrin that that toothbrush holder had not been in the dishwasher in a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, did you and Marty change your toothbrush after you were sick? We did. Because that's we another got- tip a lot of people forget about. We did. Um, you know, I, I say this tongue in cheek. My clients have been joking with me, but I have a lot of clients who have OCD, mm-hmm. you know, especially if they are uh, people who hoard. And so now they tease me and say, see, Dorothy, all that OCD stuff that I used to do, you know, my washing with my hands and checking the doors and, you know, just being over you know, I have one client who's very careful and washes spoons and forks and everything before use. So she teases me and says, you see, uh, you know, there wasn't such a bad thing after all. Also the people who, you know, don't like to shake hands, uh, who have been doing the fist bump or the elbow bump all along have been saying, see, I told you. Uh, So that may change uh, culturally how we're going about this. Um, Give us some other tips that people should be there. And of course, the tips also apply to not just preparing and planning, uh, and we're in the midst of this, so people may be thinking, Danica, what are you talking about preparing? But we still have quite a ways to go, uh, and I'm already thinking towards COVID-20, you know, okay. what we need to learn from this to prepare for next time. So start with talking, as, uh, you mentioned about people working from home, and I want to give a special shout out to all of the people who can't work from home because they have essential jobs, whether they, of course, are healthcare heroes who are on the front lines, but you know everybody who works in healthcare facilities, the, uh, the janitorial staff, uh, the uh, executive staff, the administrators, the people who are answering the phones and giving directions, uh, certainly everybody who's a truck driver keeping our food supplies safe. You talked about how you're using paper towels for everything in your house. That's not happening here in New York and New Jersey because of there's tremendous shortages of paper towels and uh, toilet paper. So we're using our paper towel supply very sparingly. Understood, understood. <clears throat> and you know, just on what you're talking about with all of these folks who are still out working on our behalf, uh, I, I'm very happy and proud to see how the status has risen for mm-hmm all of these jobs that we perform. I I feel very, very grateful to everybody about that. Yeah, so So I do have some acknowledgement to people who, when we talk from, I've heard a lot of people saying, you know, everybody's working from home. Not everybody can work from home. Um, That's just not doable. Although I saw a great email, uh, kind of one of these joke things about a woman who's a housekeeper sends a message to all her clients who she cleans house for. And she says, I'm working from home. I'll be happy to get on uh, Zoom and tell you how to clean. <laughs> but, but start with, for the people who are working from home, uh, I, I heard you claim that you could get somebody's home office organized in 48 hours. No, oh, so, yes. <laughs> so impress me. Go ahead. Okay, go ahead, Dorothy, do it. Well, this could actually work for people who are still working out in the field and people who are working from home because those folks who are working in the field still come home and have meetings that they attend, you know, whether it's through church or volunteer or, you know, some, I know a lot of 12-step programs that are still going. And so folks are needing to have a space of their own. So whether we call it a desk and an office or not, Uh, These all apply, but the first thing you want to do if you are working from home is claim an area that you feel you can be most productive. 
So it might not be your office regularly because people are in and out of there all the time. Who knows? It might be a guest room desk. It may be the dining room table. It may be like here, this is my studio. I have a little area in the living room. All the furniture is moved, you know, that way. It's a whole different scene. I took out a, a large oversized chair to make room and I put it in the garage. Um, so even if you don't have space, you're in an apartment, you still have to condense a little bit to make room for a productive area. And that might even mean taking the doors off of a closet area so that you have a nook in a closet so you can work from there. So that's the first step. Sound okay? Sounds okay to me. Okay, then the next thing you wanna do is make sure that you have um, uh, productivity so that you have your computer and, and your uh, printer and everything else right alongside of you and you need to have some sort of surge protector so you've got a lot of stations to plug in for power source. And then once you start building that space, if you have the opportunity to hang a curtain from the ceiling perhaps, for a divider so that if you feel you physically need to have some, you know, space that's just yours, go ahead and put a couple of screws in the ceiling and hang a curtain from a curtain rod and grab a lamp from the attic. Then you want to start thinking about what does your office look like at work? So that if you were at a desk in an office, try to replicate that at home. So if you've got a photo or an alarm clock, you know, an old timey alarm clock, something, a plant, whatever those things are, put them on your desk so it reminds you of what your desk looked like. Position the stapler in the same place, get those same tools out that you would use for your job. So that's the basic start to getting your space set up for yourself. All right, talk to me about paperwork management and piles of yeah. paperwork. Just because and, I know my know listeners what? want to know about this. I don't have any problem with this. <laughs> well, the first thing about paper management, I'm going to give you two different types uh, or ways to organize. And the first way is if you're going to organize paperwork, stick with just the year that you're in. <laughs> don't worry about all those past years that are piles and piles. Stop that. Just get organized with this year. And that makes your whole life a lot easier. Now, if you have an ongoing medical condition, you might need to pull past years into this pile. But well, and those of us who haven't done our taxes yet still have to deal with last year's paperwork. Right, right. So we just want to get those, just deal with this year, and then you can go find what you need in any other years. So that's what I do, collect it all and get it all set up now. When we go through each of those papers, you can um, put all, all those pieces of paper into four different categories. I call it the TAP system. Okay, T I'm writing this down. T-A-P-P, -P, TAP. So T is for toss, A is to act on it, P means you're going to pass it on, and the other P means to pile it or file it. And I'll give you an example. Let's say, you know, it's graduation time, graduation cards come in. And I know we're not really going to graduation right now because of the crowds. But <clears throat> what you do want to do is if a card comes in and you were going to honor the person, you look at the card and you say, you know, I don't really know this child. I don't know this kid. <clears throat> Why did they send me an invitation? I'm going to T, toss it or you can act on it. Wow, we know this kid, our kids have gone to school together, we love them, we've known the parents for years, I'm going to act on it, I might write out a check, I might prepare a Venmo, I might get a card, and I just keep it all in a little folder over here, and I act on it until the time comes. Or, P, I pass it on. Like, I don't know the kid, but my husband, knows that kid, they all did basketball and Boy Scouts together all those years, I don't wanna go, but. I pass it on to him to deal with. Or the other P, which is pile it or file it. Maybe you like the invitation. Maybe you go, maybe you don't, but you want to keep it because it's so cool. You want to use that idea for when your kid graduates. Mm -hmm. And it goes into a pile called ideas or a mm -hmm. file called ideas. So that's, that's the tap system. And the other last thing, if I may, is if you're going to deal with your paperwork and you're not a filer and these days, most people are, 
are pilers and stackers, not filers. I suggest using a pile system. Take a bookshelf, take the books off the bookshelf, which you don't read those books every day, but you do access the paper pretty often. Start making piles on that bookshelf. Put little sticky notes above or below that say medical, bills to pay, stuff to read, vacation, whatever it might be. Yeah, I have a pile system, but it's just all one pile. <laughs> So I think, it, I mean, that's great when you're talking about things like graduation cards. I love your TAP acronym, uh, but maybe you need to make it plural and put TAPs and then add an S at the end for shred if it's something like bills or confidential information. So now I owe you big time. <laughs> great. Thank you. Well, you can, you can repay that debt uh, by talking to me now about... Um, yeah, you know, one thing I've been very frustrated, and this is why I was joking about, but I'm really serious. I need to re, uh, reread your book about uh, facing your stuff or stuffing your face. Um, because I've talked to a lot of people, and I'm definitely one of these, who's dealing with my stress by being home and eating my stress, as opposed to being one of those awesome people who is dealing with their stress, like a, a neighbor of mine I saw out on my walk, she was washing her car and her garage looked immaculate. And I said, why are you washing your car? We're not even driving anywhere now. And she said, oh, because I already cleaned out all the closets and I cleaned out the basement and I cleaned out the garage and like, this is the only thing left. So tell us how to get started with those closets. And so instead of cleaning out the refrigerator by eating everything in there and the pantry, um, talk to us about organizing, using this time to organize the closets and the drawers and the basement or the attic, you know, wherever your hot zones are. Yeah, let me give you, this is kind of the motivation side on getting started for organizing. And let me give you at least three of those ideas. The first one is what I call an accountability partner. So you decide you want to, um, what do you want to do? You want to clear out a closet, right? So um, just take 30 minutes. If you're not the type who loves to do it anyway, don't do it for a long time. Just do it for a short amount of time and call somebody, even somebody that, you know, you have millennials in the house with you, text the person and say, hey, I'm going to start my closet at one and I'm going to finish at 1.30 and I'll text you or call you when I'm done. Okay. And just that, that commitment to somebody else has you roll your eyes and go, okay, I don't want to feel like a fool. You know, I'm going to do it. So an accountability partner, or I call it book ending. So one, start it and end it. The other one is to create what I, and you actually did this, which is great. You did what I call a somewhere else bin. So you had a desk that you needed to clear off quickly and you know it goes somewhere else then you, you, know, you, you can actually take the time and go through that bin. But what folks are doing, most of my clients, is if you're trying to clear um, a family room which, or, or an office, which often has kids' hair clips and toys and rubber bands and you know, packaging material, all sorts of things that don't belong there. You just grab a bin and go left to right all the way around the room and start putting things that don't belong in that room in the bin because it goes somewhere else. Yeah, I call that stash and dash. <laughs> I actually had a party once years ago and my kids were small and I was way behind in cleaning and I was complaining to a friend about, I had mountains of laundry in the laundry room and I had all this clutter around and uh, I didn't know what I was gonna do and there was no way I was gonna be ready for the party. And she said, how many laundry baskets do you have? And I thought she meant of the dirty laundry, but she oh, yeah. said, oh, how many empty laundry baskets do you have? And I said, oh, I probably have four. She says, take everything and put them in the laundry baskets and put it in your car. <laughs> yes. yes. And I did that. And I just, I still to this day think that's hysterical. It is hysterical. And if you're not the type who want to put the stuff away from the laundry baskets, you go back to the accountability partner, or that's where our virtual organizing comes in, and anybody can do that for you, but I certainly can. <laughs> Any, anybody can help you. Um, I like that idea. Um, the third idea that I have for you, and I love this one, it's called, uh, what do I, I like to call this one? Check the dust level. Hey. Okay, and this goes for your closet as well. So if you have a lot of dust here, 
on suit jackets you haven't worn or sweaters. So for tops. people listening and not watching, she's pointing to the shoulders on the uh, on the uh, jackets. Or my daughter was just in my closet today trying to uh, help me wear a more appropriate outfit that she didn't like the first outfit I was wearing. And she said, mom, you shouldn't even have jackets that have shoulder pads anymore. <laughs> just get rid of those. Okay, shoulder pads and dust level, okay. <laughs> You I know may- you organizers like to say, if you haven't worn it in a year or two years, get rid of it. What I advise people, if you haven't worn it since you were pregnant with your first child, get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite thing about being on your podcast is you always bring fun to this. Always. <laughs> if you but can't you know- make fun of yourself, you can't make fun of anybody else. <laughs> true enough. True enough. So if, if, if you have... Of, um, layers of, of dust on the shoulders of your clothing. That might be a clue that you haven't <laughs> worn it in a while and you may want to get rid of it. But that also holds true for games. You know, if you've got piles of games on a shelf or you have books, you know, that are just dreadfully dusty, is it worth it to keep all those things? So look for the dust. If you don't know where to start, just check the dusty zones and maybe it will be easier to declutter from there. That's a great tip. Of course, uh, you, we often hear about organizers saying have three uh, boxes, you know, the keep, the get rid of, and uh, keep, throw away, or donate. And I think during this time uh, of a pandemic is a great time to really emphasize to people about the charity element of giving away things. Uh, so I'll just throw out a plug. I'm a huge uh, fan of Big Brothers Big Sisters. And I love donating stuff to them. Uh, and, I lo- and I do it frequently enough that I actually called them. And I said, I just want to know, what do you do with this stuff? And how does it benefit the children? Uh, you know, because I was thinking, do they have to find clothing in the right sizes for people? And, you know, how does all this work? Yeah. So it turns out they don't actually give any of the things you're donating directly to the people who are the beneficiaries. They sell it to a chain of secondhand stores, thus providing employment for all the people in the secondhand stores. They get a certain amount of money. The money is used for their programs. Uh, And they told me, and I thought this was wonderful because I used to spend a lot of time saying, debating, oh, is this good enough that, you know, is this, you know, is this sweater with, you know, that's worn in some places, is this good enough to donate to, you know, a charity? And they said, don't even worry about that because they sell those things to clothing recyclers. So they said, even if you have, you know, towels that have holes in them or dirty old jeans, you know, please clean them first, but then send it to us and we can, and they can get money per pound from the uh, clothing recyclers. Yeah. Thank you for all that research (laughs) and for telling us about this particular charity. Do you happen to know if they're national? They are national and they pick, what I love about them uh, is they pick up the donations from your home and you can schedule it online. So people can just Google the Big Brothers Big Sisters in their area or they can just Google Big Brothers Big Sisters and schedule a pickup. Now, of course, they're not picking up during this time uh, and I don't know when they will resume, but there are four cartons already uh, waiting for them. And what I've done since my millennials are home is I have a box at the bottom of the stairs that is the giveaway box and that they're supposed to contribute to the giveaway box. Perfect. And just to kind of uh, put an exclamation on all of that, don't worry that so many of the charities are not picking up. Some are in some places of the country still, but if you can't get a pickup for charity or take it to them, then what you want to do is create a staging area. And I know um, in bigger cities, it can be tight, so it's hard to create a staging area, but just you know, get it into a box and stage that stuff for a later time for, for when you can give it away. So don't, don't, don't stop the decluttering process. Keep going and just stage that stuff for when you can give it away. And we all have extra boxes now because we're doing all this mail order. <laughs> <laughs> True enough. Stopping from home. Uh, so tell us about um, this concept of uh, planning, preparation, and prevention, specifically with respect to the pandemic that we're in, 
and ways to think about preparing for future crises, whether that crisis is another pandemic or whether, you know, lots of people who are listening live in hurricane zones or flood zones. Um, I know I, I think I did a very poor job of planning for this, even though I thought I had thought of everything. Uh, I did not think about the great toilet paper shortage of 2020. I also didn't think about uh, the fact that I would have four extra people in my house uh, when I originally prepared. Sure. And I also didn't think about things I should have done beforehand in terms of personal things. Like I was behind in getting my hair cut and getting my nails done and having uh, my teeth cleaned and all of those things I, was, I needed to do. And of course, I didn't think about that this would be as long as it's been. So tell us some of your prepare, preparing tips. Got it. Well, <clears throat> you, you touched on a lot of different areas. And you know what else you could throw in there is, how about your estate? And all, is all of that ready as well? Do you have a will prepared? Who would have thought? Here it is. Many people put that kind of thing off. So uh, again, I kind of go back to the COVID-19 guide that we put together. It's 10 days. It actually helps you to prepare for the next time this comes around because there is a finance section in there. There is a self-care section in there and that's the nails, the hair and all of that that you're talking about. So again, you can go to DorothyTheOrganizer.com and get that for free. But apart from all of that, in terms of prevention and, and planning, I th I'm hoping that by being home, people are realizing how much care we really do need for ourselves. And how about just jotting down a list? Like you rattled it off. Mm -hmm. I wish I'd had, you know, my dental appointment. I wish I'd had nails done. I wish I'd had these things done. If you could just rattle off a list, each of you who are watching or listening, of all the things you wish you had done, mm -hmm. that goes into your annual plan for yourself. And a lot of people don't like to plan. I get it. But if anything at all, we want to make sure that our medical documents are in place. You mentioned dig, uh, digitallifecloud.com earlier, and that is a site that actually has a place where you can do all your medical information, all that emergency stuff that you want to have. Now, still in this crisis, it's only three pages. Get that document filled out. You can print it out. You can fill it in online. It's free. It's on the first page of digitallifecloud.com. Go there. And you can take those three pieces of paper with you to any emergency, whether it's now or later. That's one of the things we all put off. Yeah, so, and that's, uh, one, of, uh, one of my read, uh, listeners sent me a question. I do accept questions at askdrdonica at gmail.com. And uh, one of the best questions that I got that I hadn't thought about was from a woman who's uh, 60. She lives alone. She's not married. She has no children. And she said, should I pack, and she's healthy, thank goodness, but she says, should I pack a to-go bag uh, just in case I have to go to the hospital? You know, sort of like you hear women who are pregnant have a hospital bag waited to pack. Yeah. And I said, no. Uh, and the reason is because you don't want to bring anything on that's not absolutely necessary with you when you go to the hospital. Uh, and I said to her, you don't even want to bring your wallet. Just bring your driver's license and you know, maybe uh, one credit card and your insurance card in a Ziploc bag in your pocketbook. And then also your phone should be in a Ziploc bag. Um, the other thing that should be in a Ziploc bag if you're going to a hospital is bring your actual medicines. I usually say bring a list of your prescription medicines, but this time bring your actual medicines because hospitals are running out of actual medical supplies, including very common medicines that people take, especially you mentioned you have asthma, you know, bring that yes. with you. Yes. Um, and then also they know exactly, you know, what brand you're on and exactly what dose. Um, and that's it. A, a phone charger, also in a Ziploc bag. And of course, don't bring anything you can't afford to lose. So if you have a wedding ring or, you know, engagement ring, earrings, watch, you know, don't bring any of that stuff with you. To the hospital. Um, as far as preparing, you also mentioned people preparing their wills and financial documents. People really don't want to talk about that. So of course, I also have to throw in a plug for the other thing I told her, 
to bring in writing would be an advanced directive. Yes. About what kind of medical care you might want and what you absolutely do not want if you are in an extreme situation. And, and what's interesting that I found with my clients, they've all been calling me to say, you know, Dorothy, you know how you told me I should get a list of all my accounts together? You know how you told me that I should probably, you know, update our will? You know how you told, and they, they said, and especially the medical stuff, I said, get it in, you know, enter it into the cloud or into a document, into a binder. And they're all calling now saying, I wish I had, I now know what it means to be in a disaster and not be prepared. So we have the time, we can do it, and we don't have to do all of it, but just do something. Well, and <laughs> even with respect to our loved ones going to the hospital, I never envisioned a situation where somebody who was married or somebody who was a parent would not be able to accompany their loved one to the hospital and would not be able to provide all of that information. Um, in many places, they, they're asking you if you need to provide information, just give us your phone number and we'll call you. Um, but you can't go in with them. And that's, you know, one of the greatest strategies. Anyway, we only have a couple more minutes. So, uh, you know, I keep coming back to, you know, your book about face your stuff or stuff your face. Am I getting the title right? I think so. What stuff I your it. face or face your stuff. Yes. Yes. So just quickly talk to us about organizing food. And of course you're, you know, you're the lady from the hoarders. So lots of people now who are not hoarders to begin with, have been thinking about, you know, actually stocking up and some people are actually hoarding supplies because they're thinking this may now have no end. Yes. Um, you know, I'm very lucky, um, as you may, and it's also in the book, but I, I used to be over 200 pounds and I lost 75 pounds and, and have kept it off by not eating sugar Fabulous. and flour. Thank you. And <laughs> I also believe that that has been very helpful to me in healing and getting through this COVID experience more quickly. <clears throat> but in terms of organizing food, I, I, you know, it's okay to make recipes if you want to, but just create some of that food and actually get it in the freezer. Do one day of batch cooking if you can, one afternoon. We can make 13 kinds of vegetables and freeze them all. And because there aren't cans and cans of foods, but there are, there does seem to be, at least here in California, enough fruits and vegetables. So we are taking the fresh food that is coming in and we are, you know, just turning it around and, and preparing our food in advance so that we can have it frozen for ourselves. And that's the best way to handle it. And again, in the COVID guide that I put together, there is a resource gathering section where you, know, you want to be able to know what your resources are and what you need to have in the house. So that's what we're currently doing to stay organized in terms of the food and possible rationing that's coming up. And there are alternatives to toilet paper. Some people have um, taken old shirts uh, and cut them up just in case. Well, we're and not there yet, fortunately. I don't think it's going to happen. It seems to be that we can get a roll or two. <laughs> I've here heard and that there. bidet sales have skyrocketed. And of course, in the ladies' room, I have to have a bidet expert, if anybody's listening. I have to have a bidet expert to come and talk about bidets, because obviously in the ladies' room, we love to talk about things <laughs> like that. So last question before I let you go, uh, speaking of being in the ladies' room, you know I always ask people what their most uh, unique, different, memorable, or interesting experience was that they ever had in a ladies' room. And you answered that in your first interview. So maybe I'll just say, in, since your last interview, what was the most memorable experience you ever had in a ladies' room? I don't know if I talked about meeting Louise Hay. No, you did bathroom. not. That's okay. good. So, so I'll tell use... everybody who Louise Hay is, who do, if they yes. don't know. Yes, Louise Hay is an amazing, was an amazing author with Hay House Publishing and and obviously, Hay House, you know, publishing was named after her, and she had so many books that we all use for self-help. Um, just, just an amazing human being. And with Louise, I was at Hay House um, working on, 
on one of my products with Hay House Publishing, and we needed an office in which to film. So we used Louise Hay's office in order to do my filming. She wasn't there, so they all said it was okay. So I was in the restroom getting dressed, ready for my interview with the publisher, and we were ready to go. And all of a sudden, in walks Louise Hay, and she says to me, you're getting dressed for something. What's that all about? She's just <laughs> really direct. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm filming. And I said, oh my gosh, you, and she said, that's right. You're the one that's in my office, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I said, yes, I am. It's so nice to meet you, Louise. I'm Dorothy. I'm an organizer. I promise I'll put it all back. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. Anyway, thank you so much for joining us again. Tell us where people can find you in the social media world. Yes, everywhere. Uh, whether it's You're Facebook, everywhere. <laughs> whether it's on Facebook, YouTube, or my website, it's all DorothyTheOrganizer.com. That's great. Thank you so much for joining us for our hundredth episode and for bringing your own confetti, which I did. <laughs> and and how <laughs> typical is this? The organizer has neat neat confetti. <laughs> <laughs> and that it was easy to find. Easy it doesn't find. make a mess and it's easy to clean up. <laughs> anyway, thanks again. Please keep us posted on your uh, upcoming projects. And most importantly, we're so happy that you and Marty have fully recuperated. Thank so, you so much. Stay, stay safe. Stay well and stay in touch. Bye-bye. That's all we have time for today. But let's keep the conversation going on Twitter or Facebook at Dr. Dunica. And please join us next week for another episode of In the Ladies Room with Dr. Danica. Real conversations with real women about really intimate topics.